Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be giving this talk. Uh, when I saw the Mises U schedule and I, uh, I realized that I was uh, going to uh, lecture on why Murray Rothbard is a great economist, I said to myself, well, uh, I know why Murray Rothbard's a great economist, because I said so. You know, is, is, is there anything else? Need, need I say more? But I, I figured, I guess, you know, if I have to speak for 45 minutes, I should probably go into more in depth. Um, Murray Rothbard is one of the most influential figures in my life. I've learned a tremendous amount from him regarding economics, history, political philosophy, current events, etc. I've edited several of his books. Uh, I think he's one of the most neglected figures in uh, economics, uh, the history of economic thought. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute travesty that he's not uh, as well known as, as, as other prominent figures such as John Maynard Keynes or Milton Friedman and, and so on. And Murray Rothbard can be seen as a, uh, a very polarizing figure. If you ask some Austrians and libertarians, they say, well, his, his influence on the movement was, was very negative, right? And I, I do not uh, subscribe to that view. I think he had a very positive um, um, marginal uh, value product, to use one of his terms, uh, on the Austrian libertarian movement. So I want to spend some time talking about why I think he's a very significant economist and why everyone should know of Murray Rothbard. Right? So what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm first going to provide a brief biography of Rothbard, his important works. Uh, for some of you, uh, you might not know much about the man, who he was, uh, and so on, what he wrote about. Uh, I want to talk about that, and I think for those of you who do know a lot about uh, Murray Rothbard and his works, you'll still find uh, this information enlightening. Then I want to survey some of his contributions to economics, what he wrote about in some of his major economics books and papers, right, and why it's significant, why he advanced the discipline, all right. And then I want to briefly explain why I think Rothbard is one of the greatest economists of all time. Right? So I think uh, for, for those of you who are Rothbardians, I think you'll, you'll, you'll greatly enjoy this lecture. For those of you who aren't Rothbardians, well, I hope to make you Rothbardians. So you know, even then, that means you'll enjoy the lecture. So my goal is to have everyone enjoy the lecture. Um, okay, so who was Murray Rothbard? All right, Murray Rothbard was born in 1926, so he was born about 100 years ago. Uh, he graduated from Columbia University in 1945, um, and then he got his Ph.D. there about a decade later. There's a whole story as to why that's the case, but he got his Ph.D. in economics. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, much about Columbia University, it's located in New York City. And at the time, Columbia University was one of the top economics departments in the nation. It was really Harvard, Chicago, Columbia. Uh, there were many prominent economists who had learned economics at Columbia who had gotten their PhDs from Columbia. So when Rothbard was there at studying at Columbia uh, around World War II, he was at one of the leading economics research centers in not only the United States but the world. And that meant he was learning from some of the leading neoclassical economists uh, at this time. All right? This is very important. He wasn't just someone who, who learned all of this stuff on his own. He uh, was very immersed in the uh, prevailing um, neoclassical uh, discipline um, at the time. All right? He had also written a very prominent um, uh, work that became his dissertation called The Panic of 1819. Uh, what was it about? It was on the Panic of 1819. Uh, this is something that's still cited. Uh, that, that, that was a bad joke. Everyone was supposed to laugh at that. So, um, yeah, but uh, it's still well cited. You, you, you read a standard American uh, history book on this time period, and if they talk about the Panic of 1819, uh, inevitably Rothbard's uh, dissertation is going to come up. And this really shows that he was a, a historian in his own right. He could write um, mainstream um, uh, work that uh, the profession um, uh, found great value in. Right? So if, if you're interested in this time period, I encourage you to read The Panic of 1819. During this time period, uh, aside from working on his dissertation, he also worked for the William F. Volcker Fund, um, an affiliate research organization from about 1950 to 1966. So this is in uh, his, early, his early years, his 30s and 40s. The William F. Volcker Fund was a very prominent organization after World War II that was really responsible for keeping Austrian economics alive. 
It was the William Volcker Fund that was paying for Mises' position at NYU. It was also providing money for uh, F.A. Hayek at the University of Chicago. And Rothbard, when he was working for the William F. Volcker Fund, he was uh, writing for them, as I'll talk about. He was uh, reviewing books and papers. He was attending conferences for them. He was basically their top scholar that they, uh, that they took great pride in. Right? So during this time period, he was writing Man, Economy, and State. Yeah, he also wrote America's Great Depression, and in the early to mid-60s, he had written Conceived in Liberty, which was published in the 1970s. All right. So this is when he was writing a, a, a tremendous amount. It was an enormous burst of productivity, uh, and, this, and, he, and he had the William Volcker Fund um, uh, to thank for that. Right. So sometimes people think that, well, after this time period in the 70s and the 80s, this is when Rothbard became Mr. Libertarian. He became just a popular economist, uh, just writing on current events and libertarian political philosophy. Uh, that's not true, right? He was just as productive uh, in the second period as he was in the first, so the second phase of his life. Oh, and during this time period, I apologize. He also, uh, in case you didn't know, published in the American Economic Review and the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which are some of the top uh, journals at this time period. So he also did that, right? Um, so he, he, he was certainly quite productive. All right. So the second phase uh, of his uh, career, he was an economics professor at the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute for about 20 years, uh, mainly teaching non-economics majors, teaching engineering students. Uh, this wasn't the uh, most prestigious job or the job that best fit Rothbard's uh, capabilities and his qualifications, but for a variety of reasons he was teaching there. Uh, one major reason was he wanted to stay in New York City. He was someone who loved New York City. For a long time, he had a phobia of leaving New York City. Right? So he, uh, he also had a phobia of elevators, but that's a whole, whole other thing. So he, he, he loved New York City. He wanted to stay in New York City. He was a man, uh, he was a man of the city. So he, he taught at uh, the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. Uh, during this time period, he spearheaded the Austrian revival out at South Royalton. So if you're interested in Austrian economics, uh, you, you hopefully know something about South Royalton. This is this uh, conference in 1974 where many leading Austrians, uh, uh, which many leading Austrians attended, uh, Murray Rothbard, Israel Kirzner, Ludwig Lachmann, and uh, several students, uh, some of whom are, are here uh, today. And this was really began the beginning of the modern Austrian movement. Uh, later in the year, F.A. Hayek won the Nobel Prize in economics. So this is when it really became, uh, you know, Austrian economics became well known. Uh, it was an emerging discipline. Rothbard uh, was publishing many essays about Austrian economics during this time period, working with students, trying to get various uh, institutes and journals to publish Austrian-related material. He was also writing a lot uh, on subjects related to economic theory, not you know, directly on economic theory, such as For New Liberty, The Ethics of Liberty, The Progressive Era, uh, and The Mystery of Banking. Okay, so he was, he was very, very, very productive. Uh, we're going to be talking about one of these books later on, uh, The Mystery of Banking. Um, and this was, this was Rothbard in, 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 you could say in, the, in, in the second phase of, 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 of his uh, very productive career. All right. All right. So then the final phase of Rothbard's career is he was the S.J. Hall Distinguished Professor of Economics at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he'd taken this position in about the mid 80s uh, until his untimely death in 1995. Right? So he now had an endowed chair, something that was uh, more fitting of his stature and his accomplishments in the profession. Uh, so he was recognized uh, in this respect. Uh, during this time period, he was also teaching at UNLV with Hans Hermann Hoppe. And um, obviously very important because uh, we wouldn't be here uh, if it wasn't for Lou Rockwell in the Mises Institute, which was at the time called the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He was the academic vice president of this organization, and he was also the editor of the Review of Austrian Economics, which was the first explicitly uh, – 
Austrian journal, right? There's a lot of Austrian journals now. There's the Review of Austrian Economics, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, uh, Austrian-related journals, the Independent Review, uh, Journal of Private Enterprise Education, etc. cetera. Uh, a lot of outlets for young scholars to publish in. The Review of Austrian, uh, Review of Austrian Economics is really the first one. Right? And this is something to Rothbard's credit. He was, the, he was the editor of this journal. Many of the Mises fellows or senior fellows whose lectures we've benefited from this week, Joe Salerno, Jeff Herbner, David Gordon, et cetera, they all, uh, they all cut their teeth in the Review of Austrian Economics in the 80s and 90s, publishing some of their uh, research uh, in that outlet. All right. Once again, he was still writing. Uh, his main project during this time period was an Austrian perspective on the history of economic thought, a uh, massive two-volume work. Unfortunately, it was not finished. Uh, he never got to the third volume because he died. But uh, it's, it's very important work on the history of economics and many of the proto-Austrians. I highly encourage you to read it if you have not read it. And he also wrote some shorter books and monographs one of the most notable being The Case Against the Fed, which is a very timely book. Uh, it's one of the first books I read about Austrian economics. I highly encourage you to read it if you have not done so. All right. So that concludes our uh, biography of Rothbard. But I thought, what would be a presentation of Rothbard if we did not have any photos of Rothbard? And many of us have seen the photos, common photos of Rothbard. You know, one, he's looking like looking this way, and then there's another, you know, he's looking this way, and then we've seen little animations of them, and I said, well, if I put those in, eh, we've all seen those, that's, that's all good. So uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get some, uh, some nice photos of Rothbard, and um, might have some photos of some other people we know in this room. Okay, so this is Murray Rothbard, I don't know if anyone's seen this photo, uh, this is Rothbard, I believe that's uh, Leonard Ligio on the right. Uh, you can see Rothbard there. He's, of course, surrounded by books, as, as he is in many, many of his photos. Um, he's, uh, he, he's, 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 he's smiling. He's happy. Uh, he's got his signature glasses on. Uh, again, this is, uh, this is classic Rothbard. This is a great photo of Rothbard. I believe this is at South Royalton or one of the many conferences in the 1970s. There's Rothbard with sunglasses just sort of staring off. Uh, in the back is, uh, I believe that's Israel Kirzner and Ludwig Lachmann, so two prominent Austrians. Um, they were also at the conferences. I just, I just love it. He's got his hands on his back, and he's just kind of staring off. It's a good photo. Uh, this is Rothbard um, at the 1983 Libertarian National Convention. So Rothbard uh, was also very active in party politics. And this is, if you've ever read the Libertarian Forum, he's got this huge article on this, on this <laughs> very climactic uh, um, a convention and he's pushing for one uh, presidential nominee instead of another. He was a delegate, so he was yeah he he was on the ground so to speak. Uh, and this is just a, a nice side photo of him. If you if, if 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 you none of us many of us haven't met Murray Rothbard, but he was uh, he was this short stout um, um, a man. He had this cackling voice uh, and so on. And I don't know. You can just you can just see it. You can just see him come come alive in in, in this photo. I think. Um, this is a, this is a, maybe not, uh, this is a great photo. Um, he's on the side. It's a good side shot of him, I'd say. Uh, you really get a view of the man, I think. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the disco guy in the, in the, you know, in the, the middle, I'm, I'm not sure exactly who that is, but I, I still think it's, it's, it's a good photo. This is one of my favorite photos. It's Murray Rothbard golfing. He's working on his golf game. Uh, he's, he's got a putter. This is a very prominent Austrian economist back in the day, uh, Suda Chanoy. She's um, in the back looking on, probably as Rothbard uh, gets a hole in one or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, this is a great photo, too. Uh, here's Rothbard um, uh, talking with a very eager, interested student who's, who's clearly mesmerized by what uh, Rothbard is talking about. Does anyone know who that is on the right? That's Dr. Salerno, yes. That's, that's our institute's very own uh, Dr. Salerno, Salerno eagerly uh, listening to what Rothbard is, is, is talking about as he's sipping on probably some sort of alcoholic beverage. I'm not sure. Um, but you can clearly tell he's interested in what he's talking about, as, as is Joe Salerno. Uh, here's a young uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe. This is Rothbard looking on. Hoppe, I guess, he has a, a, a question. 
uh, and he's, he's, he's raising his hand or willing to make a comment or something, and there's Rothbard looking on. Again, uh, two scholars who have become very prominent uh, at the Institute. Uh, so that's all the photos I have. I, I but uh, some rare photos. Um, I'm very. I thought I thought you could. Hopefully, you haven't seen those before, and you get a, you just get a a, a, a better picture of him. I think. I mean, literally. No, no pun intended. You're getting good pictures of him. I, I'd say. So anyway, all right. So now on to what are his contributions? What are his economics contributions? Why do I think he's a great, uh, one of the greatest economists? Why do I think it's a great economist that? Doesn't have to deal with him, you know, putting or uh, you know, looking happy around various people. It's this is this is it's really his writings, right? That's that's what allows him to stand the test of time. Okay, so the the most important economics work that he ever wrote, and this is a work that is, I think, one of the greatest economics books of all time. Uh, Joe Salerno and I are working on a history of man, economy, and state, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Um, Man, economy, and state, I'm going to put volumes one through three, which includes power and market, is an extremely important book in the Austrian tradition. This is not only one of the most important uh, uh, books in Austrian economics, I would say it's Murray Rothbard's best book. All right, this is him at his finest. Uh, his is him as a uh, scholarly uh, economic theorist, uh, and he is literally deducing the whole corpus of economics uh, in a tradition very similar um, to Mises's human action. Okay, so it's a towering treatise on Austrian economics, or as Murray Rothbard would say, this is a very Rothbardian phrase: architectonic edifice. Right, so it's. You see, it's, it's, it's this mighty structure, uh, and you, 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 see, you see the whole, um, basically, edifice of economics being built up from Rothbard, right? So what he does in this book is he clarifies, he refines, and he advances the Misesian paradigm, right? He advances the theories that Mises expounded in human action, right? Starting from the action axiom and other self-evident economic uh, self-evident assumptions, um, Rothbard deduces the apodictic laws of economics that apply to isolated individuals, that apply to individuals in exchange, that apply to individuals producing goods, and that apply to governments intervening in exchanges. Right? So if you haven't read uh, Man, Economy, and State, I highly encourage you to do so, and I hope to encourage you to do so with uh, some important remarks on man economy and state. What exactly is he doing? All right. So one of Rothbard's notable accomplishments in man economy and state is he shows how the law of diminishing marginal utility leads to a downward sloping demand curve. This is something Mises assumed that the reader knew, um, but he didn't really explain uh, in his book, right? He doesn't construct demand curves. If anything, he, he dismisses them for, for good reasons, but he doesn't show how the law of diminishing margin utility, right? If you increase the supply of a good, it's going to satisfy lower ranked ends, how that leads to a demand curve, right? Uh, Rothbard, uh, uh, excuse me, Mises, to the extent he talks about this, he, he basically says, uh, look at Bombavirk. <laughs> he, said, he cites uh, a, a, a German version of Bombavirk, Eugen von Bombavirk's writing. So if you're an English speaker, uh, like myself, and you look at that footnote and you go, oh, okay, it's a little bit of a dead end. But there is Rothbard uh, to swoop in and to explain uh, the deduction. All right. So this is, again, I mentioned implicit in Mises, but it's to Rothbard's credit that he, he, he shows how this is true through the, the value scale approach, right? So he says, well, if you have an increase in the supply of a good, it satisfies lower ranked ends. It'll have a lower, ranked, uh, a lower margin utility ranking. Well, then that means in order to, uh, to, for you to demand additional quantities of a good, you'd be willing to pay a lower price for those goods, right? Because each additional unit of the good is satisfying lower ranked ends, while as you give up more and more money, you're going to give up money that satisfies higher ranked ends. So this leads to a downward sloping demand curve. This is something that's very different from how neoclassical economists derive demand curves. They use the indifference curve approach. Uh, Rothbard um, really d defines the, um, it really sets the standard for an Austrian approach, right? Something else that's also very important that Rothbard does in the early chapters of Man, Economy, and State is he explains how equilibrium prices are reached in a world of uncertainty and speculative adjustment. So we think of the standard 
supply and demand curve, right? Uh, supply and demand curves, equilibrium where quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. Uh, you take a basic economics class and they're gonna say, well, if the price is set above equilibrium, there's gonna be a surplus and then the price will fall to equilibrium till the market clears and vice versa if the price is set below equilibrium. Rothbard is trying to show, okay, how do entrepreneurs in the real world actually set prices and how do we actually get to that equilibrium price or how are we trying to get to that equilibrium price? What it really is, is it's a theory of step-by-step -step equilibration, right? Where entrepreneurs are estimating uh, what consumers will want to buy. They don't know the consumer's demand curve. They don't know at what prices uh, consumers will buy various quantities of the good. They have to estimate it. And so Rothbard is showing how, well, we can arrive at equilibrium even in a world of uncertainty, right? And if, when the data is changing, the equilibrium points, the equilibrium prices are constantly changing, but the market's always moving in a direction that satisfies consumer preferences. This is something very important uh, that Rothbard explains that you don't really get in a standard um, economics course, right? So to Rothbard's credit goes both of these, goes both of these advancements. Okay, something else that Rothbard does in Man, Economy, and State, and this is really, I would say, his most important contribution is his unique production theory, right? I could spend a whole uh, lecture, we could almost spend a whole week, uh, as, as we do at Rothbard Graduate Seminar, on production theory, on Rothbard's production theory. Mises didn't really talk about production theory so much, so it was left to Rothbard to deduce a production theory along Austrian lines. And this is really his inspiration for writing uh, a treatise, okay? One of his important uh, advancements that he does is he synthesizes the mises fetter pure time preference theory of interest with the Vixell-Hayek structure of production analysis. Okay, if we remember earlier in the week, uh, Dr. Herbner was talking about the pure time preference theory of interest. Then we had Dr. Rittenauer as well as Dr. Newman, uh, the other Dr. Newman, talking about the structure of production and um, you know, why that's important. So both of these uh, strands of analysis were in Eugen von Bomberwerk, uh, Ludwig von Mises' teacher, but Bomberwerk then settled for an eclectic theory of, of, of interest, right? So something that wasn't based entirely on time preference. And so for a while, these, these, these uh, strands of analysis, Ludwig von Mises and Frank Fetter, a notable American economist with Austrian influences, was developing uh, the theory of interest while uh, uh, Vixell and Hayek, uh, F.A. Hayek, were developing uh, the structure of production analysis. And it's to Rothbard's credit that he combines both of these and shows how changes in time preferences change the structure of production. Okay, and Rothbard spends many chapters in Man, Economy, and State doing this. And this is, this is a, a, a truly uh, important uh, and incredible achievement. All right. So. Now, I thought to myself, well, I could explain what Rothbard is doing using diagrams from Man, Economy, and State. And I said, well, that's not really fun. That would be very technical uh, and so on. Uh, again, this is, this is a, a lecture on why Murray Rothbard's a great economist. Uh, so I said, well, I, I want to do it. I want to explain it how Rothbard explained it. Okay. Um, so something that we found in the archives that someone sent to us that I think is really great is from the 80s of Rothbard uh, writing down capital theory on a napkin. So this is from um, a Rothbardian, Anthony Flood, and he, had meet, he would meet with Rothbard in New York City. They would frequently go to this deli, eat very, uh, presumably very greasy food, and so on, and, and, and they, would, they would just talk shop about Austrian economics, libertarianism, et cetera. And one day, uh, he had a question on the structure of production, and you know, Rothbard drew it on a napkin, right? He, on, on one side of the napkin, he, 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 drew, <laughs> he drew a structure of production. If you haven't seen Murray Rothbard's handwriting, um, it's very, very messy, all right? I had to translate. I know a language, Rothbardanese. It's, it's, it's an entirely new language. I'm, you know, one of, it, 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 one of the few people who can read his handwriting and him scribbling stuff down. We'll, we'll go through the other side of the napkin where there's more writing. This is him showing the structure of production. Now, I'm not going to be so cruel as to actually... Uh, make you, you know, try and explain it with, with, with the napkin. I mean, this is the actual nice diagram from Man, Economy, and State. So 
maybe you, you've seen this, and this is him showing that production always consists of a series of stages where the original factors, land and labor, are uh, producing a capital good that then is sold to a later capitalist who combines the capital good with more uh, land and labor to produce another capital good, then that's sold in the future, so on and so forth, until a consumer good is finally produced. And we can show the income, uh, how the income, the, the 100 uh, ounces uh, that's spent on consumption, how that is uh, filtered throughout the structure of production. Or at the end of the day, that income completely needs to go to the capitalists in the form of interest income, as well as income to land and labor. We see at the top, income to land and labor, 83 ounces, uh, and then interest income, 17 ounces, that's got to equal 100. Right. This is a very notable advancement from, uh, by Rothbard in, in explaining why this structure of production matters, why it's important not only for general equilibrium, but also the real world. Right. And as Rothbard shows uh, at the bottom of the napkin that if there's a decrease in time preferences, uh, there's going to be an increase in investment and more stages are created. Right. The uh, structure of production becomes more roundabout. Right. So uh, at this point in time, uh, Mr. Anthony Flood asked Rothbard, saying, well, how do we know that each new investment is always going to be in more longer production processes? So I imagine at this point in time, um, Murray Rothbard then flipped over the napkin and he, he drew this, this, this diagram, this, this, this checkered box. He, he never drew this in any of his uh, uh, books, but he, he, would always, uh, he would always talk about this, explaining why each new um, uh, investment, each new embark embarking upon a production process is always going to lengthen the structure of production. Now, I'm sure you can't read any of the scribbles on the side. Uh, I also want to point out there's probably, again, some food. I don't know if that's a coffee stain or just some, some greasy food from the deli. Uh, but let's, let's, let's decipher what Rothbard's doing here. All right, so that says shorter processes, and that says longer processes. Uh, I, I, can, I can show this more, you know, the actual translation, but this is what they mean. Then Rothbard's got more productive and then less productive. So it's really a spectrum, but as Rothbard was saying, but you can, you can just use this simple box. And so you've got the shorter processes that are more productive. As Rothbard would always say, he says, well, those are like manna. We've already taken those up. Those are the, those are the gimmies. We've, ar we've already gobbled up those production processes. We're not going to be able to use them anymore, right? Then you've got the longer processes that are less productive. So that's the bottom right. Why are you going to embark upon something that takes a long uh, time and it's not going to be that productive? All right, well, you're not going to do those, right? Those, those, those aren't going to make any sense. So now you're stuck with you can either embark upon processes that are longer and more productive or processes that are shorter and less productive, right? So the, what we'll choose all right, assuming we have the savings and our premium on present uh, satisfaction isn't uh, uh, very high, is we're going to choose the longer process processes that are more productive. Okay, this is why as we increase our investment, the economy becomes more roundabout. It takes more time uh, to produce various goods. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> At this point in time, I imagine they finished their sandwiches, and you know, and fortunately, this napkin was was kept. This is from uh, the summer of 1986, and anyway, I, I think this is I think this is really cool. So I hope I hope you you guys think that's that's cool too. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so let's move beyond uh, man, economy, and state. Let's go to some of his other writings. Okay, Rothbard didn't just write a massive treatise on Austrian economics. He also wrote many many essays on economics, economic theory, and so on. Uh, these were originally published in a uh, two-volume book called The Logic of Action, uh, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Uh, the Mises Institute, about a decade ago, republished these as economic controversies. This is a collection of essays published on method, history of thought, private property, taxation, and history. Uh, I highly encourage you to read this book if you haven't. It's very large. It's about 900 pages, but it's composed of a lot of short essays. And in many ways, it's a good introduction to man, economy, and state. Uh, the uh, introduction to this book was written by Gene Epstein, who was here earlier in the week at the Soho uh, debate. And he, he said, economic controversies is probably the better way in. Uh, man, economy, and state could come a bit later. This is him talking about which one should you read, right? And we could 
have this debate if you read Man, Economy, and State first or Economic Controversies. But for those of you who haven't read Man, Economy, and State, might be intimidated. Uh, this is a, this could be a good way in because there are many uh, essays of, of varying length that uh, you can benefit from. All right. So I wanted to talk about uh, I, I, I could talk about many essays in this book, but again, we only have so much time. Uh, so I wanted to talk about something that related to my earlier uh, talk in the week, which is on the money supply. All right. I mentioned that banks are in the process, uh, they're in the business, excuse me, of, of issuing money substitutes, right? And that these money substitutes constitute the money supply, right? So a demand deposit at Bank of America, uh, that's part of the money supply because people expect they can always redeem it for the money proper, right? Uh, but what about other types of financial securities? What about time deposits? What about savings and loan shares? What about deposits at mutual savings banks, right? Rothbard wants to figure out, okay, are these are institutions also in the business of issuing money substitutes? So this essay is, which Rothbard wrote in the 1970s as part of the Austrian revival, Rothbard is trying to answer the question of what counts as a money substitute, right? And that determines the proper definition of the money supply. And I think Rothbard makes a very important contribution uh, in this essay, building on a lot of uh, the analysis that he did for America's Great Depression, and it's very different than the Chicago school, right? We're, we live in the world of 2022 where no one even talks about the money supply, right? You know, it's not even tracked by the Federal Reserve anymore. There used to be a day many moons ago when everyone was obsessing over the money supply statistic when it came out. Now, it, it, you know, no one cares, right? I'm sure no one even knew it came out this week, right? But it actually did. A monthly statistic on the money supply came out. So the Chicago School, right, no, well known for Milton Friedman and his monetarism, bas basically argued that whatever, you know, how we determine what the appropriate uh, money supply, M1, M2, M3, uh, M4, et cetera, is just whatever best correlates with nominal GDP, so with nominal income. Right? So if adding something to the money supply aggregate uh, now correlates with nominal GDP or is a better predict predictor of nominal GDP, well, then that means it's a more accurate uh, money supply definition. It's a more accurate definition of the money supply. And Rothbard uh, very uh, correctly, I think, basically says that definition is, is wrong. Uh, Rothbard doesn't care so much about prediction or correlations, Rothbard cares about explanations. Are we actually getting at the essence of what money is? Right, if, if we throw in peanut butter right, into our monetary aggregate and it correlates with nominal GDP better, uh, does this mean we is peanut butter a money substitute? Is peanut butter part of the money supply? I mean, that would be nuts, right? Yeah, there we go. It's another bad joke. It must be late in the day. Um, but, all right, that, that was really bad. I might have to open the windows for that one. But, so um, uh, Rothbard uh, argues, in particular, Rothbard argues that savings deposits are economically identical or indistinguishable from demand deposits. Back in the day, savings deposits paid slightly higher interest. Banks could um, refuse or invo invoke an ability where they don't have to um, uh, redeem the deposit. Uh, you couldn't directly spend the deposit. Sometimes you had to convert it first into a demand deposit. Rothbard says those are immaterial, right? It's the equivalent of, let's say, you have a $1,000 bill uh, that you can't spend at stores. You have to convert that $1,000 bill into 10 100s uh, or smaller change. Would we say that the $1,000 bill is not part of the money supply? No, we wouldn't, okay? And uh, quite interestingly, at the beginning of COVID, the, the Fed more or less adopted Rothbard's approach in M1, finally including savings deposits as part of the money supply. So, you know, it's great. At the same time, by just one month, just adding all of the savings deposits in the money supply and not correcting that for the past just makes the money supply statistic useless, M1. So, sort of a Pyrrhic victory, but, you know, I'll, t I'll take that. 
Uh, but this is, this is a very important contribution of Rothbard. People sometimes argue, oh, Rothbard's analysis of the 1920s is, is incorrect because he's throwing things like uh, certain um, uh, life insurance policies in the money supply, and that's just ridiculous. Uh, even though Rothbard, when he was doing this, was building on prominent economists such as Arthur Burns and other thinkers who said, well, maybe these are actually uh, part of the money supply. All right, so it was Rothbard the pioneer, and it's Rothbard who should go the, uh, to, to goes the credit for coming up with an accurate definition of the money supply. Right, and this is very important. The Mises Institute's Ryan McMakin uh, frequently comes out with releases on the Austrian money supply, uh, which is basically the definition of Murray Rothbard's as well as Joe Salerno's. Uh, what counts as the, the, the sort of the the the, the most accurate um, uh, money supply statistic? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we can go to the mystery of banking. All right. This is uh, Rothbard's sole textbook. It came out in the early 80s. If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it. Uh, it's a great introduction to monetary theory, uh, the basics of banking, and the history of money and banking. One of the first books I read uh, by Rothbard. And even though he's not coming up with many unique theories, he's building on what he already wrote, it shows that he's a great economist because – most economists can't write, and most money and banking textbooks are absolutely terribly organized. If you've seen stuff, they've got current events, then they go to financial questions, then they go to maybe some eclectic history of why the Federal Reserve did the right thing at the right time, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then at the very end, there's monetary theory, and it's not even the good monetary theory. Uh, the price of money is the nominal interest rate, and it's just this, it's just this headache uh, um, in contrast, Murray Rothbard's book is it's very uh, uh, well-structured. Uh, I think it's a great outline for teaching a money and banking course. I've used it. Even when I haven't used it in teaching, it's still excellent. You start with monetary theory, then you go to banking theory, and then you go to the history of money and banking. And it's, it's uh, just something very, very important. Right? So something that Rothbard does that I think also shows, shows why he is a great economist, uh, is he was a master historian in the Misesian tradition, right? Showing why humans acted, what were the particular motivations behind various laws, right? Providing sort of an, a, a special interest analysis of laws. And, and, and one thing that Rothbard does that many economists didn't do, and they criticize Rothbard for doing, and now that they do this, they still don't give Rothbard credit, is he applied this to money. He applied this to money and banking, right? He applied this to central banks, right? Who are the actors actually pushing for the Federal Reserve, okay? Well, Rothbard showed that it was various bankers associated with J.P. Morgan and Company, National City Bank, Kuhn Loeb and Company, and so on, right? Well, why did they want to benefit? Well, Rothbard goes through what were the motivations that they were trying to um, uh, enact, you know, what, what were their goals, and so on, right? Rothbard is trying to show, you know, not only who benefits, but in specifically which people benefited, right? He doesn't just want to show you that, yes, private bankers lobbied for uh, a central bank. He wants to show that you know, private bankers X, Y, and Z lobbied for a central bank, okay? So he's, he's bringing his theories to life, basically. He's, he's actually uh, providing uh, much-needed context. And again, you don't you don't find this in a, in a banking book. He, they might mention, uh, well, there was a bunch of panics and we had the Federal Reserve, or they're going to say in one sentence, oh, yeah, there's this Jekyll Isle thing, uh, and then they just kind of move on, and you're just sort of wondering, well, what happened at Jekyll Isle? Who was at Jekyll Island? You know, what was, what, 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 can't we talk more about that? And, you know, that, that's what Rothbard does in The Mystery of Banking and in many other uh, works on central banking. It's a power elite analysis where he names names, all right? This is, uh, this is something uh, not directly related to economic theory, but it's an application of Rothbard's economic theory. And this is something that makes him very unique. Many economists don't want to do it. They don't want to name names because they don't want to criticize the powers that be. Why don't they want to criticize the powers that be? Because then that could hurt their job prospects, right? Uh, you don't want to criticize the biggest employer of monetary economists, right? If you're a monetary economist, you don't want to criticize uh, the institution that's providing nice research grants to monetary economists, conferences, journal outlets, et cetera. But Rothbard did that, okay? 
Uh, as he would say, he said, I did it because no one else was doing it, All right? Okay, so I've just spent 40 minutes of everyone's life talk, you know, talking about Murray Rothbard, why he's a great economist. Well, don't take my word. Take Mises' word. All right, sometimes people say, well, Mises and Rothbard were really different. Right? Rothbard was doing his own thing, and, and Mises, uh, he, he never really, uh, you know, he, he didn't directly follow in Mises' footsteps. And I think that's completely false. I think that's a gross distortion of the history. So why don't we look at what Mises uh, wrote about Rothbard in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, okay? So Mises wrote, um, uh, when, when Rothbard was writing America's Great Depression, he applied, uh, he had a research grant for that, and Mises wrote the letter of recommendation. All right, and here's what he said in the letter of recommendation. Mises is not one to uh, provide a lot of um, uh, praise uh, for economists, uh, but he, he made an exception for Rothbard. He said, Rothbard is an extraordinarily talented young man, a keen thinker and an indefatigable worker. Right? I am fully convinced that he will one day be counted among the foremost economists. I fully endorse what he says about these matters, and I want merely to add that, in my opinion, nobody is better qualified to perform this job than Rothbard. Okay. I would like a letter of recommendation like this, right? I think we all would, right? But this is a, this is a, a very strong letter of recommendation that shows Mises clearly thought Rothbard was a great economist, okay? For Mises to write this for someone really shows how much he valued Rothbard's thinking. Then Mises reviewed Man, Economy, and State. Maybe a lot of people have seen this review because uh, this one is not on a private letter. It's in a publication that's been printed before. Um, this was, came out in the fall of 1962. Rothbard says, excuse me, not Rothbard, Mises says, quote, Rothbard's work is an epochal contribution to the general science of human action praxeology, and it's practically most important and up to now best elaborated part, economics. Henceforth, all essential studies in these branches of knowledge will have to take the full account of the theories and criticisms expounded by Dr. Rothbard. He's basically saying if you want to be an economist, you got to read Rothbard's book. Okay, once again, this is a nice statement, right? Uh, to say, oh, yeah, well, now every, if you want to be an economist, you got to read this book. I mean, that, that, that really shows that Mises valued Rothbard uh, as, a, uh, as, as an economic thinker and thought he was a great economist. Okay, and then we can finish up with a, a letter Mises wrote in, the, in, in December of 1962 to a noted philosopher, Louis Rougier. He was, uh, was, um, uh, this person had written to, Roth, uh, written to Mises, excuse me, about uh, his questions about praxeology and then uh, said, well, where, where could I look for? Where's the proof of, of, of the praxeological theorems? And, and Mises said, the proof of the cake is in the eating. I can only refer to the systematic exposition of the whole doctrine of praxeology in my book, Human Action, and nowadays in the brilliant book of a younger man, Murray and Rothbard, Man, Economy, and State. Right? Basically saying that if you're looking for the systematic exposition of the whole doctrine of praxeology, you should look at Human Action and Man, Economy, and State. Those are not my words. Those are Mises' words, right? Um, and then when Mises' third edition of Human Action came out in 1966, uh, we, uh, we found you know, there, he, he really inscribed a little, uh, little uh, nice thing for Rothbard's personal copy when he asked Mises to sign it. He said, to Murray and Rothbard, pioneer of praxeological analysis with all good wishes, March 2nd, 1967, Ludwig Mises, right? Uh, it's, it's a little interesting when Mises would sign things, he sometimes wouldn't use the Vaughn, Right, so just Ludwig Mises. So people thought that, oh, this isn't actually a real Mises. This is a forgery. Right? No, this is, this is the real deal. Right? So uh, if, you're, if you're in the market for buying Mises memorabilia, just make sure you know, uh, you know what you're getting. Uh, but again, this, this shows that Mises really valued uh, Rothbard. Right? He really valued him. He thought he was a great economist. Right? So in conclusion, Rothbard's a great economist, not because I said so, but because Mises said so, right? Now, in reality, Rothbard's a great economist because he made many important contributions to economics. And I would say the two most important Austrian economists, and make the argument the two most important economists of the 20th century and potentially uh, throughout history, uh, you got Mises and you got Rothbard, right? So I think 
you know, this is only a small analysis of, of Rothbard's many contributions to economics, but hopefully I've, I've inspired many of you to read Rothbard, uh, to read many of his writings, his papers, and so on. They're in many collections the Mises Institute has. And for more on Rothbard, I recommend that you read, you've got David Gordon, The Essential Rothbard, right, covers not only economics, but his also his forays into other fields. Uh, Joseph Salerno and Matt McCaffrey, The Rothbard Reader, which has a lot of short writings of Rothbard. And uh, a book by Joe Salerno and myself, The Making of a Misesian Economist, which is forthcoming, which is showing Rothbard's development as an economist um, in his writing of Man, Economy, and State in the 1950s and the 1960s. So I think with that, I will conclude. So thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>